Okay, I think it's time to get started. I hope everybody had a good lunch. Um, we have some amazing talks this afternoon. Um, and uh, this is going to start off uh, with uh, my colleague Tom Hollander's talk, uh, where he's going to explain how you can modernize your apps with MongoDB Relational Migrator. I don't think you need any more introduction than that, do you? So could we, have a please, uh, uh, could we please have a big round of applause for Tom? Thank you very much. Hey, thanks everyone. Um, fantastic to be here in New York uh, once again for MongoDB.local. Um, and it's even more exciting we can talk about a new product. Uh, so yeah, my name is uh, Tom Hollander. I am a product lead here at MongoDB. Um, and uh, today you are here, hopefully, if you're in the right spot, to hear about how to modernize your apps using a MongoDB Relational Migrator. But before we get into that, I want to start with an ode to the Relational Database. They're the most beautiful, simple things in the world. Um, you start with your problem domain, you figure out what are your core concepts, what are your nouns, you make those things your tables, you figure out what are the attributes of those things, they become your columns, you figure out what data types you need, and then you figure out what the relationships between them are. Is it a one-to-one, -one? is it a one-to-many? And then you just wash, rinse, and repeat, you're done. Uh, nothing could be simpler than modeling your, your problem as a, in a, relational, with, um, a, a relational model. At least that was what I was taught at uni. But if anyone's worked on a relational um, data model, it can very quickly become something that's pretty un unwieldy. Um, so the number of tables starts ballooning into something kind of ridiculous. Um, and you need to buy really big printers to be able to actually put all this stuff and show it on a, on a piece of paper. So if you're working with um, applications with legacy databases, legacy data models, there's a few things I've seen, and maybe you've seen some of these things as well. They can be unnecessarily complex. So definitely the schema, once you start getting into like fourth normal form or whatever, the idea of like one table per noun really breaks down. You end up with this proliferation of join tables and reference data tables and things that need to be split in weird kind of ways. Your database code. So whether it's your queries that have to join four different tables together and reassemble these small pieces into something meaningful uh, that are hard to write, hard to maintain and slow to execute, or the store procedure. I don't know if anyone had to deal with store procedures, but you have to write your business logic in some reasonably archaic language. Um, you have some cranky DBA that won't let you deploy your code. Doesn't work with any of your DevOps models. Yet somehow that's where you have to put most of your application's business logic. Then there's the application code. So even once you move away from your database code, you might have application code written in a reasonably nice programming language, but a large amount of it needs to be um, spent uh, translating between your table model and your, your business objects. So even if you're using an object relational mapping framework or whether you write your own code, but it's a whole lot of gumph that you have to maintain and is really the most um, enjoyable part of, of being a developer. Relational database schemas are notoriously hard to evolve. So if the universe changed, you need to go and store some extra data. Even like adding a single column to a table can be an ordeal. And if you need to change columns or split or join or split or merge tables, that can be an absolute nightmare. Relational databases are also really difficult to scale. Um, so they're essentially designed to run on kind of one server and they'll scale up. That's great until you run out of resources or run out of money. Um, they really were designed to scale out. So it's not the good way of building these type of new web scale applications. And they can also be very expensive to operate. So certainly if you have one of the classical uh, sort of relational databases from a large vendor, they can be very expensive. The guy will come with his clipboard uh, to order you every now and then, which is never a fun process. Even if you're using one of the open source databases, there are a lot of hidden costs uh, in terms of um, particularly the DBA costs and the cost to keep these systems running reliably. So overall, looking after one of these applications, I think is a little bit like looking after this um, lovely garden on this property here. So you're stuck with all of this work that you have to do and you can't do anything fun with it anyway. So why are you bothering? And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I kind of like to have fun when I'm running code. Um, and it would be nice if there was a better way. We didn't have to do all this kind of stuff. So hopefully you're here at MongoDB local because you have heard or experienced that indeed there is a better way of doing this and that way is MongoDB. So for developers, MongoDB is great. You get this agility. You don't need to spend all your time writing this super plumbing code. Uh, but you've got this high fidelity between your application and your persistence model. So you end up with the great developer agility. For the organization, if you look at across multiple applications, uh, MongoDB helps uh, eliminate what our product marketers love to call the data and innovation recurring tax, which is effectively 
just all the, the, the deaths and the complexity that can accumulate with all these rigid databases. And of course, MongoDB gives you unparalleled opportunities to, where, to run your database where you need it, whether it's uh, on an IoT device, whether it's in your data center, or whether it's in one of our um, three major cloud providers. So if you're in a situation where you've experienced some crappy databases that are hard to maintain and scale and expensive, and you've seen that maybe, yes, there is a better way. I built this MongoDB app, and it was way better. Why don't people just migrate their applications all the time? And there's a whole lot of reasons why it's a pretty hard thing to do. So most organizations have hundreds, if not thousands, of applications, each with different business value, complexity, age, um, and even understanding which application does it make sense to modernize. Uh, what is the ROI going to be? How difficult is it going to be? It can be really difficult to get started. It can be sort of stuck in analysis paralysis, and it's uh, often sort of easier just to do nothing. So I was uh, joking about how complex relational schemas are, and they definitely can get very complex, but chances are that um, you or other people in your organization have done this a lot of times before. You kind of know the tricks of the trade of normalizing databases. Um, and it might not be immediately obvious, what is the right way of doing that in MongoDB? How can I reimagine the data of this application and have it make sense as a MongoDB application? And then supposing you figure out what the schema should be, how do you actually get that data into that schema? So the data is not going to migrate itself. Um, how do you move it over? There's a lot of data migration tools that can move data kind of one-to-one. -one, but if you want to go and mold it into a new schema, um, that's been a very difficult problem. Um, and last but definitely not least is the dilemma of what happens to your application code. So say we get through those first three problems, we've got our data all migrated and it looks lovely, but your application is still expecting to be able to run an Oracle query and it's using a, uh, a, a, a persistence model and a driver for a relational database. So what happens to that application code? How do you actually move that code forward into the new world? So face again with this challenge, there's these applications that are really not fit for purpose anymore and the relational database is a big part of the problem. Uh, you've seen that there is a better way, but getting there is just too hard. And a common reaction has just been to put, put your hands up in despair and scream uh, because it just, there really weren't any good ways of, of moving from the old world where you don't want to be and you can't have any fun to the new world where you love to get to but you have no idea how to get there. So the good news uh, but is that there is a, a shining beacon of light on the horizon, and that is a new tool that, um, that, that we're talking about today, which is called Relational Migrator. So Relational Migrator is a product from MongoDB that allows you to bring your relational workloads to MongoDB with confidence. So it's got a whole bunch of features, which I'll walk you through in a minute, uh, but at the high level, it allows you to design an effective MongoDB schema that's derived and mapped from your original relational schema. It will, of course, do the, the migration, uh, so it will move the data from the source database to the destination MongoDB, uh, and it will transform it to align with your, your, with your cluster. Uh, and finally, it will help with the application code side of things by generating code artifacts uh, that will minimize the time and risk and effort involved in actually moving that application code to MongoDB as well. Uh, and the really exciting news, which hopefully uh, you saw in uh, Sahir's keynote, is that Relational Migrator is uh, available to use today. If you go to mongodb.com slash relational dash migrator, I'll tell you a little bit about how to get started and, and how it runs and stuff like that in just a minute. Um, but it is available to use and it's generally available as of today. So let's see what this thing might look like and let's go and actually modernize a legacy application and see how relational migrator can help. Um, and the application we are choosing um, is a, uh, an application called Northwind. If anyone's had the um, misfortune to uh, spend a lot of time working with SQL Server, uh, you might be familiar with Northwind as one of Microsoft samples, uh, which I shamelessly borrowed for the purpose of this demo. Uh, but it's a great choice because it is a genuine legacy data model designed a long time ago with some supporting application code. So it is contrived, but hopefully when you see this, there might be some things in your own organization that look kind of familiar. So the application itself is a backend management system for an e-commerce store. So you can see that something that people who work at the back of the store would use to maintain details about customers and orders and things like that. This particular application is a web application written in C-sharp. Uh, it uses an object relational mapping framework called the Entity Framework, and it is used uh, SQL Server 2016. 
I should emphasize that Race for Migrator works with a whole range of databases, which I'll get through in a minute, but that's the specific uh, choice of technologies that this sample application has, um, has inside it. So this application was written in 2013 and has a lot of 2013 era technologies in it. Uh, there have been some efforts uh, by the development team to um, add new features, but the architecture decisions and technology decisions are really a bit of a time capsule that is kind of uh, carbon dating it back to around 2013. But it is still solving a uh, critical business problem. So um, it is something that the business absolutely needs to uh, keep alive. Uh, the challenges of this particular application, well, there's a few of them. Uh, certainly from a cost perspective, so the organization has found that the licensing costs for the database servers, not just in production, but in staging and development, are uh, sort of disproportionate to what they think that they should be paying. Um, and uh, probably even more importantly, there's issues with developer agility. So the developers are saying it's really hard to make changes, uh, so they do them rarely, and it means that the business is suffering as a result. So hopefully this is yeah, the kind of thing that you might have seen in, um, in some of your own um, situations. So um, let's show you what this application looks like. Um, and so this is the beautiful web interface. Um, so obviously professional designers involved here. Um, the application, you can see at the top, it's got employees and customers. It's basically a big kind of CRUD interface to help you maintain these sort of core entities. So you can see employees at the top. We've got some filters. Um, so we can go and choose which employee. We can go and see the employee details and all the information that we have about each employee. Um, on the customer side, it's a bit more interesting. We've also got some fancy sorting and searching and finding. We've got some pagination. Uh, we can go into the individual customers. And a customer has got a set of orders. So one customer has got multiple orders. And then every order has multiple line items with products. So you can see we've got this kind of quite deep hierarchy of linked tables. And we can also do editing and deleting and things like that with this particular application. Um, so in terms of how it's built, so this is a SQL Server application. So this is um, SQL Server Management uh, Studio. And you can see here, it's kind of built the way you'd expect. It's got a lot of little tables. It's got um, columns with a fixed schema. It's got primary keys and foreign keys and all that kind of stuff. So you've probably seen some applications a lot like this. This is the code here. So again, it's a C-sharp application. Uh, we have a data access layer where we have a reasonably nice generic typed data repository with a bunch of functions to help with CRUD and finding and things like that. Um, what's interesting about this application is it uses um, a, a, an ORM called the Entity Framework. This weird designer is kind of how you map your tables to objects. So you can use this tool to say that this table should represent an object that has these properties. And it generates code. So the model is actually basically a graphical designer that builds these uh, POCO classes that represent the core entities used by the application. So that's our um, patient for today, is the Northwind application. Um, and um, in the operating theater, we will be doing these things. We will be uh, designing the new schema, we'll be migrating the data, and then we'll be updating the application code. So let's start with the process of designing a schema and we'll be using MongoDB Relational Migrator to do exactly that. So, there we go. So this is MongoDB Relational Migrator. So it's got this uh, web user interface. Um, and the experience uh, starts by connecting to our, our source database. So this time we're going to connect directly to the database. You can see the supported databases here are Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, and Postgres. So we'll choose SQL Server in this case. Uh, then we'll enter the details of the database we're going to connect to. We'll set some SSL details, and we will connect. Uh, Relational Migrator will then show us all the stuff that's inside this database. So we'll find all the databases and schemas and tables and we'll select which ones are in scope for this particular migration project. So we'll expand and we'll select the DBO schema of the Northwind database. There's a couple of tables we know we don't need, so we're gonna go and deselect those ones so we can keep our migration as kind of finely scoped as we, as we really want. Um, this page here lets us choose what we want our initial MongoDB schema to look like. Um, so we can change the casing if you wanna go and, and deselect and do a global replacing of the names. And we can decide whether we want the initial schema to look like the relational schema uh, be a blank canvas, or we're going to choose the option to start with a recommended schema. So if you look at all the tables, you can see it's pre-selected the tables that the tool thinks will make good collections. And you can see it sort of picked these kind of top-level entities, not the join tables and other things. But for this particular application, we know that it really only works for customers and employees. So much as the other suggestions were sensible suggestions, we can customize and override these and deselect the things that we know we don't need. And that will leave this really tidy schema where we just have the customers and employees of the top level collection. There we go. So this is our diagramming surface here. So you can see uh, on the left on this new layout here, we have the pink one. 
which is this lovely entity relationship diagram showing what our source schema look like. And then you can see on the right is a preview of what your MongoDB schema. And you can see that already, uh, because we chose the recommended schema, it has taken the customers and employees collections or tables and has embedded all these other tables in a two. So you can see that the uh, employee has uh, here employee territories, order details, orders, shippers, territories. It's got all these different things in it. Uh, so it's basically followed the foreign keys to figure out what goes in there. In this case, we don't actually want to have orders because we know the application doesn't need to have the orders inside the, um, the collection. So we can simplify the schema even more by doing that. Um, and we can also make some further changes to the schema here. So on the um, customer side, we have the order details. We actually want to embed the product table as well. So we can create a new mapping. We can say we want to create an embedded document and we can choose that we do that from the products uh, table. So then we can choose which of the fields we want. We don't need to have all of them. We can choose just a subset if that's what we want. Uh, and then we can go and save that. So we've now mapped an additional table into that particular uh, collection. We can also make modifications at the field level as well. So you can see this customer has got a, a contact name and a contact title. And we want to make some modifications here to actually split the name into first name and last name, which might be a change you might make during migration. So we're going to deselect the current contact name because we don't want that to be migrated as is. So we can customize uh, the, the which fields are included or excluded. Um, and instead, we're going to go and create some calculated fields um, that have the first name and the last name. So we deselect the contact name there. Then we're going to add some calculated fields. So we're going to add a field called contact.firstName. Uh, and that will allow us to like, nest the contacts uh, under an embedded object. And here we can run a little JavaScript expression. So in this case, we're going to use the split operator to split the contact name on a space character and then get element zero from the array and put that into this particular calculated field. You can have more complex logic if you needed to in these calculated fields. Uh, then we're also going to do the last name. So con exactly the same thing, contact.lastName. Uh, and we'll do the exact same thing, except for this time we'll choose element number one from the array is instead. Uh, and we'll get the contact title. We want to put this under the same contact subdocument. So we're just going to change contact title to contact.title. And if you look at the preview on the left, you can see that we now have this nice little nested object that, re that refers to the particular contact this application. So there we go. In just a few minutes, that would be even quicker if the video worked. Um, we've gone and taken this um, uh, relational schema with a whole bunch of tables, and we've made that collapse into just two collections that have a whole lot of things associated with them. So great, we have our schema. How are we actually going to get our data into that schema? Um, and this is going to be the next video. <laughs>、oh, you can see on the top of the, of the tool, we have a navigation bar with a few features. We're going to choose the data migration tab here. And this is where we can run our sync jobs. So we're going to run a sync job here. We can connect to our source database. It's going to be the same one here, but you can connect to a different one if you want to migrate different environments. Uh, then we choose our Atlas cluster. So I've entered my details for Atlas. And this is our sync option. So you can see we can do a snapshot job, which will migrate all the data and then stop. Or you can do a continuous job, which I'll show you later on. So we're going to start with the snapshot job. We're going to drop all the existing data. And we're also going to choose the option to verify the data. What that will do is after the snapshot job is completed, it's going to go and basically do a document by document check that none of the data was lost or corrupted, which can give you extra confidence during a data migration. So we're going to start the migration job because this is a demo. Uh, there's only a few thousand rows, so it'll be done in a matter of seconds. The actual migration time will depend on a whole lot of factors, including the network speed and how big your database is and things like that. You can see it did the snapshot stage, and then it verified the data, and the whole thing was done in the blink of an eye. So that's great. It looks like it did something. Let's see if it actually worked. So let's open Compass. Um, and you can see that we have our Northwind Mongo database with customers and employees. So this is the employees. You can see that it's got all this base employee data. It's chosen sensible data types. Um, in this case, the employee territories have come through as an embedded array. So that's looking pretty good. And then let's go to the customers, where we have even more complexity here. So we have our contact, where it split the what was uh, first name and last name to separate fields. So that looks pretty good. Uh, you can also see that we have an array of orders. So every customer has multiple orders. Every order has multiple line items, which are called order details here, um, as well as a shipper. And then every line item has got a product. So yes, you see we're going like about three levels deep. Uh, we've nested a whole lot of stuff, but it means once you retrieve your customer, you now have all the information you need about that customer in one spot. Not always the right data model choice, but it's the choice that is working uh, pretty well for this particular application that we're building. So 
that is basically how the data migration works. So you run a job and it will transform the data in flight. That was a snapshot job. Let's look at the other type of job now, which is a continuous job. And I'll discuss the scenarios in a few minutes, but continuous jobs are great if you want to do a zero downtime migration, because after you uh, migrate all the data, you will basically go and watch the source system. And as changes are made to that source system, those changes will be replicated and transformed to MongoDB in near real time. Near real time. So you can see here we're running the uh, snapshot stage as usual. That should finish in a few seconds again because it's a little database. But then the CDC stage will start. And this is going to run forever until you say you've had enough. Uh, so basically it is watching that source SQL server system and waiting for some changes to occur. So um, in order to actually see if this works, we're going to have to make some changes to our SQL server data. So we're going to go and um, make, uh, basically run some SQL scripts. But uh, first, let's go and actually look at this order. And you can see that this first customer has order number 10643. So we're going to make some changes to order 10643 and see what happens. And this um, order currently has three line items. But we're going to run a SQL statement to add a fourth line item to the order details table. So we're going to order product number 70. It costs $77.70. And we're going to order seven of them, because why the hell not? Um, so let's go and run that. You can see that's been committed to the SQL server. The CDC job should now pick up this change, and we have metrics in the tool that will show you um, the, um, the events that have come through. So that will tick over, and it will say that it's picked up the, uh, the change event once it finds it. And then it will apply the same transformation rules and update the data in MongoDB. So you can see the change has been picked up. We'll go back to Compass. We'll refresh the screen here, and we'll open that first order. And then rather than having three line items, we've got four. So we've got zero, one, two, and three. Um, and if we open line item number three, you can see that we have product ID um, uh, 70 and that with um, seven of them. But you can also see there's embedded products. And that's kind of interesting because the change event didn't even have the product. It just had the product ID. So Relational Migrator realizes that the schema requires that dependent object. And it does what we call backfilling of the schema to make sure that the resulting MongoDB model is consistent, uh, even if the change only had some of that data. So that's pretty cool. Um, so now let's um, just check to see if we make some other changes. So suppose we like uh, product 70, the Outback Lager, so much we're going to have a thousand of them instead of just seven. So this time we've replayed that change or applied that change to SQL Server. Um, we'll see this tick over to two because it's picked up the change event. Um, and then when it does that, we can go back into a compass and make sure that that particular event has come through. So we should still have the same number of line items here. But in this case, um, it will be... Uh, 1,000, not 7, so that looks like it worked as well. And finally, if you complete this, let's say actually the Outback Lager was terrible after all, actually it was a massive mistake, and let's go and delete that um, order, order details entry. So we'll delete that. What's interesting here is this is a delete from SQL Server, but we're not actually deleting any documents in MongoDB. What we're doing is actually removing surgically a single line item from a deeply nested array. So we're actually able to go and figure out what the required change is to make, this, um, um, uh, to make this consistent. So just uh, to have a look here at the order details, we should back to having our three line items because the fourth one has disappeared. So that's how a change data capture job works. I'll talk a little bit more in just a couple of minutes about the scenarios in which you might want to use that. Um, before I get there though, um, yeah, so once you are finished, so once the, everything's up to date, you can complete the CDC job. That will do some final tidy up and match actually how you tell the tool that you are no longer need to sync the data and you're ready to cut over um, as part of your migration project. So the last of our key steps we wanted to do for our Northwind application was to actually modify the application code. Um, and so this is a, uh, sometimes a complex under, uh, undertaking. We're not going to do all the things in the tool today um, that we plan to do in the future with AI and things like that, but we do have some great capabilities that you can use um, already. So we look back at the top nav bar, you can see we have another option, which is code generation. Um, and the code generation basically will use the tool's knowledge of your target schema, um, and it will generate helpful code that will cut down the amount of effort and risk involved in doing this migration. So we'll go and choose the code uh, generation tab. And you can see on the left, we can choose which programming language we're working with. So remember, this is a C Sharp app but we do also have options for uh, Java, JavaScript, and various JSON artifacts as well. So we'll choose the C-sharp template, uh, C-sharp language. We have a couple of different templates that we can use here. Um, basically, what, code, what kind of code do you want to generate? 
Um, and then you can see we have the two collections, the customers, the employees, this is at the left, and it's generated a whole bunch of source files. So basically what it's doing is it knows the patterns for C-sharp development. You have to have properties for each of the MongoDB fields. You have to have these fancy attributes that explain how it maps uh, to, um, to the model. Um, we've got some quality of life things like a two-string and a two-json method. Uh, but, it's, but it's not just a single flat class because this is a deeply nested schema. We have all these inner classes as well. So this will give us like a strongly typed set of classes that represent the entire set of interconnected tables. Um, and it went and generated all those. So yeah, you could probably write this code yourself if you were a developer in this particular language, but it'll take you it's a lot of time. You probably make some mistakes. If you change the schema, you have to redo it. This makes it much, much easier. So you can see it's done this for the employees and it's done it for the customers. It's also generated these uh, CRUD helpers. So it's not just the object, it's also the classes that will do the, um, the CRUD methods. So here we can download the code. Um, and the next step is to actually integrate that into your application. So today that is up to you. You have to figure out what to do with the code. But um, I have yeah, actually gone through this process with, um, with this particular application. So if a product manager can do it, I'm sure you guys can. Um, so I've plugged in the data, the repository classes, repeat, re deleting the generic repository that was there. I did make a few changes. So I had to add a couple of extra methods that align with the way the application was previously written. Um, but the basis of the code was those repository classes that were generated. Um, I've also gone and replaced that weird entity framework model with a punny diagram. And I basically just pasted all those entity classes that came in directly out of the code generation. So this um, really was just a drop the code in, I updated some namespaces, um, and that code was basically ready to go. There was a small amount of plumbing, just wiring things up, making sure I was talking to the right classes. Um, but it, probably 80% of the code that was needed to make this particular application work with MongoDB was actually generated by that code generation. So this is the application, and you might recognize it because it looks just as awful as the original. And that's significant because it means I didn't change the user interface. So um, we can see we have the customers, the employee tabs. We can edit the customers. Um, we can, um, so I'm making a change and I'm saving it back in this case. The pagination is all working. Um, the details is showing the full hierarchy where I can see all the orders and I can see all of the order details in the products. And this actually is way more efficient because previously um, the ORM was doing all these little subqueries and joins and stuff like that to pull this in. Uh, now, because we put everything into just two collections, it was actually super easy. Uh, so it's doing a lot less work. So this is a genuinely migrated version of a, whatever it was, a 2013 application. Uh, got working with MongoDB thanks to uh, MongoDB Relational Migrator. So hopefully that was kind of cool, but it was a sample. Uh, and let's talk about what this might mean for you. So how might you use Relational Migrator for your own workloads? So let's talk a little bit about the scope uh, of what the, the tool can do. So our core databases, we support our Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, and Postgres. Uh, we do also have an off-menu option to migrate uh, from Sybase ASE that requires a component from one of our partners called Archeon. Uh, if you have an interest in Sybase migrations, please talk to your MongoDB account manager and we can talk about how that works. Um, the tool uh, can migrate data from an on-prem, uh, a, a cloud VM hosted, or it can also talk to AWS Aurora, RDS, or Azure SQL database as well. So regardless of where you've deployed your source database, chances are you can migrate. In terms of where you migrate to, um, so of course it's MongoDB, that's what the tool is all for. Um, most of our customers are choosing to migrate to Atlas, our fully managed cloud service. Uh, but if you, uh, if you find that uh, self-managed MongoDB is a better fit for your workload, then you can absolutely use Relational Migrator to migrate to self-managed MongoDB as well. So the form factor of the tool, um, it is a downloadable tool uh, that you can download and put on a machine of your choosing. Uh, it's not a cloud-managed service today, although we'll likely have a flavor of that in the future. Uh, this might seem unusual, but it actually gives you the most flexibility into making sure that the tool is able to get network connectivity to your source and destination databases. Uh, the tool is Java-based and runs great on, um, on uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, basically runs exactly the same way, so whatever you want to use. Uh, runs fine on your laptop for a demo. Um, obviously, you'd be better off putting it on a, a cloud VM or something um, if you're doing a, a real migration. As to where you run the tool, uh, the network latency and network performance is a huge factor in how long your migration jobs take. Um, so I made the mistake uh, yesterday I was preparing for a demo to uh, do what I always did and connect to a particular source and destination database. 
but those were in Australia because that's where I'm from. And uh, it turned out that the job was very, very slow when the um, migrator on my machine was going over the Pacific Ocean twice. Ran a lot better when I uh, connected to a local database or I could have run a uh, relational migrator on a VM in Australia as well. So making sure that you have network connectivity, good network connectivity is the key thing um, in terms of where you run your, um, your copy of migrator. Uh, there's a couple of deployment models uh, with the tool. So when you download the tool today, um, you'll get this nice simple installer. It'll be up and running in, um, in a matter of seconds. Um, and that's basically running as one process on one machine. Uh, that's a super easy way to run the tool. Uh, great for proof of concepts and great for jobs up to about a terabyte. Uh, we don't recommend this model for larger jobs, not because the tool can't do it, but because anything running on one computer or one process is going to crash eventually. Uh, your dog will trip over the cable or um, the network will crash or something will happen. So we don't want you to run a job that's going to take weeks or something with this model just because we don't have the resiliency that uh, might be necessary for a job that large. For the larger jobs, uh, we are working on this. So this is not, a, this is not GA today, uh, but it is coming around the corner. So this is the opportunity to integrate Relational Migrator with Kafka. And Kafka is great because it provides a highly reliable, highly resilient messaging environment. And Relational Migrator basically becomes a Kafka Connects plugin. Uh, and we're able to use uh, Kafka to get that resiliency. So um, this is something which we have in preview for Snatch Hold jobs now. We'll have CDC jobs later on. Um, if this is a model that's of interest, again, talk to your MongoDB account team. Uh, we will make it generally available a little bit later on. Uh, but it's not, not the what you download today. So every migration job and project is different. Um, so it's definitely not a one size fits all. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about some of the key kind of migration patterns we see and how a relational migrator might fit with those patterns. So the four scenarios I'm going to talk about are single application migration with or without downtime, uh, phase migration to multiple and connected apps, and also an operational data store. So let's start with the simplest, a single app migration with downtime. Now downtime sounds like a dirty word, but often it's actually not a big deal. It might be an internal application, no one's using it on weekends. And if you have the opportunity to schedule an outage for your migration, it's going to make your life a lot simpler. So um, yeah, not always an option, but uh, sometimes a completely fine option. So this is something you can absolutely do today with the tool. This is where snapshot jobs uh, come into play because you can uh, basically take the legacy application offline, start the outage period, migrate all the data as a snapshot job. Once all the data is migrated, do our final acceptance testing and launch the new app. And then by the time your internal people come back on Monday, it'll all be working. So absolutely possible today, although yeah, keep in mind the about one terabyte is not a hard and fast rule. Um, but if it gets beyond that, it might be something which would be a better fit for the Kafka model. Uh, the other option, the, the other scenario is if you want to migrate a single application, but you can't afford the downtime. And that's where the continuous replication job that I showed you in the demo comes into play. Uh, but the basic approach there is that you can run the job while your legacy application is still online. Uh, so maybe the, the, the data replication will take a few hours. Meanwhile, a bunch of new transactions have occurred and then Relational Migrator will replay those transactions until everything is caught up. Um, so again, with the caveat that you don't want to run this job for a super long time, um, you can absolutely do these uh, continuous jobs uh, without downtime by, um, by using uh, this tool today. So these scenarios are both we have like a single app talking to a single database and uh, hopefully uh, you've got some of those. A lot of particularly big organizations tend to have this a much messier situation where you have a large number of interconnected applications all sharing the same database. Um, these jobs are difficult. They're not just difficult for technology reasons, but uh, sort of process and sequencing and a whole lot of coordination is required. Um, these can be done, uh, relational migrator can absolutely help here, but in this case, usually you'll need to replicate data for an extended period of time because you can't migrate all the apps in a short amount of time. So this is something which, if you have some of these projects, we recommend deferring those until we have the Kafka deployment model, uh, just because you have uh, the need for extended CDC. And the last one I'll talk about is on an operational data store. So this is interesting, it's not technically speaking a, a migration, but it is something that we have a lot of people ask about. So in this case, you have one or more legacy um, systems. It's not practical for whatever reason to turn those systems off. Uh, they are still the system of record but you don't want to make your, your um, IT environment any worse by building more and more applications on those old legacy systems. 
So an operational data store is basically where we do continuous replication for an indefinite period of time. Uh, and then we build our new generation of applications and have them read and write from, uh, from, from the data store, which is built with uh, MongoDB. So this is also something which is absolutely in scope for relational migrator. But uh, in this case, the continuous job will basically run for years. Uh, so this is something we'd recommend uh, looking at once the uh, Kafka deployment model is available as well. So just a couple of, um, of closing notes here. Um, so we're really excited by Relational Migrate and we hope, um, we hope it's, it's got your interest as well. Um, but these projects are, are always got complexity to them and Relational Migrator is a tool and the tool helps support a, a larger set of processes and the right people to achieve an outcome. So it's definitely not a just point the tool at the problem and all your migration woes will go away. It's really more that the tool in the hands of the right people, the right processes, will do a, a massive job in making these migration projects way quicker and way less risky than they were before. So from a process perspective, you want to make sure that you are looking across your portfolio, figuring out which applications are the right candidates, come up with a migration plan, are you going to do continuous or snapshot jobs, make sure you design your data model, your queries effectively, and have a solid approach to application development. From a people perspective, MongoDB has loads of people who can help you. We have our solution architect team. We have our professional services. We have our system integration partners. Uh, for your people, we have training and certification that will help you get up to speed with MongoDB. And of course, we have our support teams that can help keep your applications running well once they're in production. Uh, so that's uh, really all I had to go through today, just to leave you with a few uh, next steps, which I'd love you to do. Uh, so please uh, download Relational Migrator today. So again, that's mongodb.com slash relational-migrator. Even if you don't have a project to migrate straight away, it's a really fun tool to play with. Uh, we have a sample schema option, so you can even use the tool if you don't have a real database to connect to. You can get a feel for the data model, you get a feel for the code generation. So um, definitely something you can get up and running and play with and have fun with. Uh, and hopefully it will maybe get your mind thinking about what types of projects you might want to do for real. And when that day comes, yeah, make sure you choose a good project. Um, while we definitely aspire to be able to support a whole range of projects, uh, for your sake and ours, like, don't start with the biggest, ugliest application in your portfolio. Start with something simple. Get, your, get confidence in the tool's capabilities. And we'll, of course, be continuing to enhance the tool over time. Um, and we'd love to hear how you go with your initial migration projects. Um, as I said, people are key to these projects being successful. So make sure that you collaborate with your MongoDB account team. Make sure you're all set up for success. Uh, and when it comes time to actually do your migration projects, we really hope that um, the relational migrator will make a big difference in terms of getting that project done. So I've got a whole four minutes of time for questions and no ability to hear the questions, but I'll see how we go. Even the mic doesn't help much, but anyway. <laughs> so in, in terms of data types, what are the limitations? In terms of? Data types. Data types. Yeah. So relational databases have a, usually a really complex type system and everyone is different. The BSON type system is actually much simpler. So there's a large number of like, Oracle's got like 17 different types of strings. Uh, well, we have one. So generally speaking, we collapse uh, the weird and wonderful types into the closest equivalent. Um, you can use calculated fields to do things like, um, like parse a Y and an N to a Boolean. Uh, or convert a string to a date. So you can do some of those things with calculated fields. Uh, we will also, not, yet, not now, but in the future, we'll give you direct control over the target type. Um, For example, Postgres has the JSON page store. Are it's the migrator able to identify those data types and move it successfully to the database. Yeah, yeah. So, so we know what all the types are. We show all the types in the, in the, in the core diagram and then we'll pick the right type. Um, and if the type is wrong, you can use calculator fields to, to, to choose the type. We also do support some of the more esoteric types like um, MySQL has a bunch of geospatial types. Postgres has JSON as a type and we convert the JSON to a document. And you can also use calculator fields to cherry pick the JSON things that you want. So you get actually some pretty good control um, when using the JSON types in Postgres too. Oh, um Hey, does it migrate the indexes and other stuff because... So yeah, it doesn't migrate the indexes. So it does not. Um, it, it, the tool creates its own indexes that make the migration as fast as possible. Uh, we don't know what queries your application will need. Um, the indexes that existed in the old app might be a good guide, but they're definitely not definitively the ones you'll need in the new application. 
Um, so you can either create the indexes if before or after migration yourself if you wish. Um, but the, we, we create indexes specifically to support like, being able to efficiently find where we need to embed documents and stuff like that. Hi, thanks. Uh, is there any capability for migrating stored procedures? Uh, so, uh, yeah, there, it, it's possible to migrate stored procedures. Um, so that, that is not a feature in the product today. Um, I don't know if you saw the keynote this morning, but there was a teaser uh, where we're actually looking at AI-driven conversion of stored procedures and SQL queries. So not in the tool today, uh, but something that we are actively working on right now and plan to have a, 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 a feature for that later in the year. I think we've got time for one more question. If anybody else over there, Jen, we have our hands. Oh, we've got a hat to do that bit today. So in the uh, migration tool, you were able to uh, transform a name field by putting in some, some script to split it into first name and last name. Yep. So we can see the tool can transform data. Can you filter data? Uh, yes, like, I can. Like, like, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to migrate the whole table. I want to want to migrate a certain subset. Yes. So I didn't show the feature of the demo, but we have in the UI a feature called table filters, um, where you can specify basically a where clause that applies to a table. That lets you do incremental migrations. You can migrate all the customers to start with A today, and all the ones to start with B tomorrow. Or you can do date ranges or ID ranges, things like that. So yes, we can support that in the tool today. Okay, and with that, we've run out of time for questions. So if we could give Tom another big round of applause, please. Thank you very much.